Hey, how are you? Hey, I am. I'm tired today. I'll tell you what. I spent the whole weekend at my childhood camp. We there was winter camp happening there. I got to go up and be one of the camp pastors and just hang out with a bunch of junior hires and man, we played nine square, we played laser tag, we went tubing, we you know, had worship time and Bible study time and we ate a ton. But man, I am worn out. They have more energy than I do. Man, no doubt. <laughs> How are you? Uh, I am also pretty worn out. It's been a heavy couple of weeks. And so we had a bunch of things going on at the church. And the last one in the list of overlapping things that we had to prepare for was this event that we had today where we hosted a bunch of leaders from throughout the community at the church building, some of whom were Christians, some who were not. And we got to share with them a lot about what we do. And it went brilliantly, which is awesome. But boy, am I tired. Man, no kidding. You know, you can fudge an event with various groups, but not a group of other leaders. They're all kind of, they've got a wary eye on what you're doing. Absolutely. Though it was fun. This is a little detail, but it was a fun one. The woman who was doing the primary presenting, she is used to being probably in like a college presentation hall kind of a situation where the slides are up behind her and she has a clicker and those kinds of things. And uh, yeah. we were able to give her the full church treatment, which means not only did she have it behind her, but there is a confidence monitor in front of her so that she can see what everybody else can see. And I was running the presentation for her, so she didn't even have to think about it. And she was clearly quite impressed. Uh. And that is what we were going for. Uh, nice. When you bring leaders into your space, you want them to walk away thinking these people know what they're doing. And it was fun to see that happen. I am so glad you could fool another group of leaders. That is awesome. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, <laughs> yep, we tricked them. <laughs> All right. Well, since I'm just in the vein of insulting you, we should probably just move on and yeah, find no, out what. It's all right. I'm used to it. <laughs> All right. Well, what's on your mind? You know, I am calling, I have been thinking about a, a topic re about discipleship over and over again. I've run into it a couple of times on Facebook posts. I've run into it in a book that I was reading. I have been thinking about it personally in terms of spiritual maturity and where I'm at in the journey. And that topic is the idea of dying to ourselves. I feel like this is not a topic that comes up a lot for me, except for recently. And yet it seems to be a major biblical piece of the story, both as the high point of Jesus' life that we are invited to emulate and a key element of what it means to be a follower of Jesus and something that is fundamentally foreshadowed even in our own baptism, and yet not something that I think about a ton when I think about discipleship or spiritual growth. And so I just want to put this idea out and say, what do you think? Has this always been a major part of your, your thinking on discipleship? What role do you <laughs> think death to self is supposed to play? Uh, tell me where you're at with that. Go. Oh, wow. That was... Man, I shouldn't have asked. I should have just stuck to insulting you because that's <laughs> that was a lot of cannon fodder. <laughs> right. I know this is clearly something that has been spinning around in my head a lot. And I didn't know how even to introduce the topic without going too much into it. I, I thought about starting off by saying, you know, I've been thinking about dying to myself lately. What do you think about that? <laughs> But somehow that just doesn't seem like, I feel that's, like it needed to have some context. Right, right. That's like the scene in The Princess Bride where he's like, do you have six fingers on your right hand? And he's like, do you always start conversations this way? <laughs> um, yes, that's exactly it. As um, you wish. There you go. And I don't think that's copyrighted. If so, I don't know what to do with that, but. There you have it. 
Um, okay, well, dying to self, man, it's interesting that we're talking about this today because as we record today, tomorrow is Ash Wednesday. So I guess that makes this Fat Tuesday. So we're entering into the season of Lent and we're really looking at the, you know, to use old language, mortification of the self. And so that mm. is rather appropriate that you bring this up today. Uh, but it's interesting because in my spiritual formation class, she assigns us different spiritual practices for X period of time and then write a reflection on it. And our spiritual practice for this current period of time is humility, which I think fits into this as well. So these are all kind of convening for me, really through outside sources, like you're bringing this up and Lent is coming in, in this class. I don't know from from me, from my intrinsic thinking about faith or maturity or growth or whatever, that I really think a lot about death of self as part of that. So, But clearly, I need to because all of these other external factors are pushing me toward it right this moment. Yeah, and I'm intrigued. I enjoy the fact that for us, as we are recording, this is the beginning of Lent. For our listeners, this is the middle of Lent. So it is also interestingly timely for them as well, even though we didn't particularly plan that out. Uh, you're absolutely right. This is a fascinating moment to be thinking about dying to ourselves as we are invited throughout the Lenten period to ask ourselves, what does the crucifixion of Jesus mean for me in my practical everyday life? And I think that's where I want to start. I want to start with knowing that we are talking about dying to self. Let's begin, you know, this is basic Stephen Covey leadership jargon. Let's begin with the end in mind. What is the end goal of the spiritual growth process? What are we trying to become? Whenever I think about this, I... I think back to, do you remember R.C. Sproul? Oh, of course. Okay, so Sproul wrote a book called The Consequences of Ideas, or The Consequence of Ideas. I don't remember if it was plural or not. And it's his basic survey of philosophy. And he, he introduces the book with this story of taking his son to an open house at a, at a local private high school. And there were all of these introductions to the sciences and the maths and the processes that students would go through in the various classes. And it all ends with this big kind of lecture by the headmaster of the school. And then he opens it up for questions and Sproul raises his hand and says, that's all very interesting. I'm thrilled about all these things that you're doing, but what kind of students are you actually trying to turn out? And the headmaster is honestly, in Sproul's recollection, somewhat flummoxed by the question. He doesn't have a great answer, and Sproul was very disappointed because at the end of the day, if you are going through an education process, knowing what you want to result in seems very important. And when we're talking about discipleship and we're asking what is the role of death to self in discipleship, I think the most important question we can start with is, what is the end we are trying to to get to? What does spiritual maturity look like? <laughs> it's funny because as you're talking, I'm thinking one common approach to this is to say we are trying to become like Christ. And mm -hmm. I've heard others push back on that and say, we will never become like Christ. Christ is Christ. We are not. That is a, it's setting ourselves up for a false vision. Uh, so we should, you know, maybe be Christ disciples, maybe as another way to go for it. You know, I'd have to think more about the, the pros and cons either way. But e at the end of the day, Jesus is our example, however we want to nuance that. And mm -hmm. it, Jesus, it's it's fascinating. Yes, Jesus conquered death. Yes, Jesus saves us from our sins. Yes, Jesus has 
defeated uh, Satan and will f- defeat him fully in the future. But he did all of that through the cross. He died hmm. to do that. And Paul seems to think that his life in Christ means a life of death, death to self, death to a variety of things. And Michael Gorman wrote a book called Cruciformity, talking about how Paul's life, uh, his vision for the Christian life is a cruciformed life, that we live and represent Jesus in his death, but also in his resurrection. And so I have a hard time putting all that together, quite honestly. I know that's a lot of words, and some of them might be spiritual, but I have a hard time holding all of that together. And I think our culture also has a hard time holding these things together because our culture does not like weakness. It does not like our own death or our own uh, – it, it, it seeks self-aggrandizement. And that's not self-aggrandizing in any way, shape, or form, that the way to advance is through death. That just is hard for me to grasp. And, you know, one of the things you're saying that I think is fascinating is that – the cross is held up as the paramount example of living the Christian life, right? Like on some way or on some level, that's what we're invited to emulate, which actually corrects a thought I was going to. I was going to start off by saying dying to self is merely the means by which we get to whatever the end is supposed to be. But if you're right, and I think you are, Dying to self isn't merely the means by which we get to some other end. It is the end in, in, in and of itself. And I would add this piece to it as I'm thinking through what you're saying. When somebody asks me, what, is, what does spiritual maturity look like? I come back to Galatians chapter 5 and say, it is fully grown fruit of the Spirit in my life. I am fully expressing love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Somewhere in, in the definition of maturity in Scripture, I think the full formation of those character traits is an essential piece of it. And the, the way that I think this connects with what you're saying is really powerful, love that is willing to be sacrificial— Joy that can transcend complicated, difficult, painful choices. Patience and self-control that can get me through dying to myself. Right? Like gentleness. I don't know that I have ever been gentle that it didn't feel like dying to myself. (laughs) Right? Yeah. I don't know that I've ever been kind when I was not choosing someone else over myself. But see, here again, and I, this is where I want to tease out something you said earlier, because mm-hmm. um, I, I was not necessarily saying that death is the end in and of itself. I do think death is a prominent piece of what it means to be a mature Christian. But I don't think even in Jesus' story, we could say that was the end in itself. Otherwise, there would be no resurrection. Mm. There would be no ascension. There would no be reigning with uh, God the Father forever. So I think in some respect, it was a means to an end. And I think for us, it's still a means to an end. Even in the way you described the fruits of the Spirit and living them out, we have to die to self in order for those fruits— to really be produced in our lives. So it's not an inconsequential means to an end. I mean, it's it's very much a necessary means to an end, but I do think there's something on the other side of it. Mm. No, that, that I think that's fair. Something profoundly different, however. I don't get to lay down my ego in order to pick it back up again. (laughs) <laughs> right. Does that make yes. sense? A hundred percent. And let me jump forward here. One of the reasons this has been on my mind a lot. I've read several references to this in the 
writings of Paul in the Bible. And I find myself realizing that as a reasonably mature believer, it is very easy for me to point to other people and tell them how they need to die to themselves if they are less mature than I am. Like, I had this conversation with somebody earlier today. Uh, One of the guys in one of our houses has just a, a foul mouth, and I said to our director, hey, you just need to send him to me, and as his pastor, I will sit down with him and tell him he needs to keep his mouth clean. That is not a problem. That is clearly going to be a death to self for that particular resident of one of our programs, right? He is used to speaking in, a di- in one way, and he's going to have to learn a whole different way of using his mouth. It's easy for mm-hmm. me to point to that. It's equally easy for me to point to somebody who loves the spotlight and say, man, see how much they desperately need to die to self. Wow. It is significantly harder for me to identify clearly how I need to die to self. Everybody else's needs are much clearer to me than my own. Well, one, I mean, I I guess I think a couple of things in response to that. One, it means we always need to have somebody wiser than us, further along the path than us in our lives, Mm. so that they can, from their advanced position, look at where we're at and say, this is what you need to do. And hopefully it will be just as plain to them as, you know, a foul mouth is to you. Mm. So I, I think it speaks to the value of having wise guides. But then- That's a good point. I think it also speaks to the process of death to self, because there are things that we have died to in ourselves. There are things that we're no longer working on, but there are other things that we still are working on. There are other things, there are other ways in which we still do need to die to self. And so I do think it's, it's a progression Right. I mean, Paul talks about continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Uh, So I I think this is part of what it means to die to self, to continue to ask the question, where am I at now? What's still rising up in me? And you use the example of somebody who is seeking the limelight. And I don't tend to seek the limelight. That's not my preferred place to be. But I sure like the limelight. Like if I have preached a sermon, I love when people tell me I preached a good sermon. I find a lot of joy and satisfaction in that. And if if people read my papers that I write or read whatever else I've written and they say, wow, this is really good. This is really insightful. Or if somebody listens to our podcast and they give me praise about the podcast, I eat that stuff up. Now, on some level, like human beings enjoy praise, and that's not a bad thing. But when does it slip into liking the limelight or seeking the limelight or something like that? I really still have to wrestle with that, even though I'm not a quote unquote one of those guys, right? Or not, not a limelight seeker, I still might be a limelight lover. Absolutely. I, I, deeply resonate with this, even in our our own podcast here, we have a very specific breakdown of responsibilities. You do all of the editing and I do all the social media stuff, which means I spend time every single week, honestly, trying to get people to follow us. And yeah. I, I am delighted when people do follow us. And and let me just take this moment to welcome folks who are new. It's so exciting when somebody listens to our podcast for the first time uh, and even more in- exciting when somebody jumps in even a little bit more and joins the community and is uh, responding on Facebook to some of the things we post and really is not just listening, but joining the conversation because that's really our heart is to, to create conversation space. But 
even with all of that, I find myself asking, what does it mean to die to self when I'm in the process of trying to gain a following? (laughs) Right. Right. Which is so counterintuitive. Um, Yeah, I was talking with a, a retired pastor the other day who is now devoting himself to uh, quite a, quite frankly a lot of the missions work that he was already doing, uh, but then also almost exclusively writing when he's not doing that mission work. And I, I was asking him about the process of uh, being a writer and getting published, and he was also lamenting the idea that he has to kind of hustle for a followership and prove his medal to the publishing company just to get his books published. You know, this is a guy that was a pastor for 25 plus years. He was a profession, a seminary professor for a long time. And, you know, he's, he knows his stuff. He's wise. He has good things to say, and he's got to just go out there and hustle like everybody else. And so I don't know. It's, it's a weird, weird world we live in. How do you, how do you not get wrapped up in it all? Yeah, absolutely. Well, and let me, so we're we're talking about something I'm not sure how much folks will be able to relate, though we're all on social media all the time and constantly paying attention to how everybody else is paying attention to us. So maybe that is more relatable than I, I was thinking now that I talk it out. But let me push this into your world. And as I'm saying this, let me acknowledge that I'm also going to push it into my own world. But what does this look like? for you at home? What does this look like for you at work? Like, what is the real practical life example of dying to self in a given week as Josh from Oregon? And I'm thinking about the same thing. What does it look like practically for Josh from Missouri going about his day-to-day life? You know, if I'm being perfectly honest, there are times I want to get noticed by the right people and invited to speak, uh, whether that's preaching or speak at a conference or something like that. Or I want to, you know, have somebody like just come alongside and and see some of my writing and be like, yeah, you really need to, you know, push that writing or whatever. I, I want people to engage with my presentation of ideas and say, I want more. And I want you to do more in this arena. And yes, I want to be recognized for that. I want somebody to come alongside and and say that. And um, I'm reading a book called The Flourishing Pastor. And he refers to three perilous paths that pastors can go down. Uh, Celebrity being one of them, uh, the Lone Ranger, or being a visionary. And that celebrity, even though, like I said, I don't necessarily seek the limelight, I'm not like Mr. Gregarious, but I still want to be noticed and I still like the limelight. But one of the things he says later on, practices that people should embrace, was embrace obscurity. And that Mm. hit me like a ton of bricks, like, wow, embrace obscurity. I had asked my pastor when we first got to the church, I'm like, What do you guys need? And he goes, honestly, the biggest need we have is in our kids program. We need consistent volunteers in the kids program. And I'm like, great, I will do the kids program. And there's a a part of me that's like excited to do this because I mean, hanging out with kids is great. But there's another part of me that's like, there's just like this voice in my head that's like, really, you're you're finishing up an MDiv just to teach a bunch of fourth graders in Sunday school, and Like, what about, you know, being a pastor or doing these things, right? But there's something that's like really, really good for me spiritually to just be a fourth grade Sunday school teacher and uh, embrace obscurity and just be like, no, this this is the service that my church needs right now. And I can do it. So I'll do it. That's what it looks like in my life right now. That's a great answer. That's a great answer. I I appreciate the phrase, embrace obscurity. That is a great spiritual habit. And I think 
for me, as I ask myself, what does that look like? I am in a role at my church in which I am often the person who keeps things going. So I may never be on stage on a Sunday morning except to welcome the whoever's preaching, but I'm the guy who was on stage before the service who ran the entire meeting that told everybody what to do. I am going to be the person who welcomes every single person to our church. I am trying like crazy to be the person everybody remembers because I know I'm exceptionally good at making people feel welcome. And I wonder if embracing obscurity for me means training up some awesome greeters to knock it out of the park and then choosing to let it rise or fall on them on a Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. And if I don't train them well enough, I'm not covering for it. Yeah. Not because I'm unwilling, but because I'm going to pull back even more from the spotlight. So I want to ask then if, if dying to self really is a necessary prerequisite in order to produce better fruit on the other side of it. If you were to successfully die to self in that area, what fruit would be on the other side? Hmm. You know, there would genuinely be greater peace. When I am serving on a Sunday morning, there is a frantic freneticness or a frenetic franticness that I live in that, honestly, I am good at, that is sort of my ADHD superpower, and it's great, but it also feeds my ego, and I would be in a space that would be much more settled because I would be rushing around less. I would be much calmer. I would be, yes, my peace quotient would go up. Hmm. That's a great question. And certainly makes me now want to do it. That's <laughs> the, and by the way, that is the power of a great question, right? A great question inspires hope. And hope is a belief that the future can be better than the present. Which is a really cool thing. Like, I, I guess I didn't know that that question would bring that reaction. But it's cool that it did because in my head, my internal monologue as we're recording this, I'm like, huh, we're going to get to the end of this segment. And our listeners are going to be like, huh, I guess I should probably die to self. Huh, that doesn't sound very fun. Huh, well, okay, what else is on the radio? You know, and just like move on. But then... You know, like when you're because expressing this kind of... Because it's 1972 and everybody's listening to a radio. Uh, okay. The next uh, the next podcast, what, what other podcast is on there? What else is on Spotify? Is that is that better? Yeah, am there I, we go. Anyway, am I more excuse modern my interruption. Now? Continue on with your <laughs> excellent point. <laughs> uh, my excellent point was to reiterate your excellent point because that's really the best. Uh, so, yeah, but honestly, like... When you talk about the fruit that's on the other side, and that's the motivation that'll actually like get you to do it, well, hey, that's cool. Maybe that's a model for how to go about death to self. Like, wow, if I were to die to myself in this area, what would be on the other side? Like, if I think about the, you know, teaching fourth graders thing, I think joy would be on the other side for me. If I just embraced obscurity and just enjoyed being where I was. Like, there's a lot of joy in hanging out with fourth graders every day or every Sunday. Mm -hmm. I just think it would be a lot of fun and it wouldn't have to amount to anything. It wouldn't have to be an expression of my perceived worth. It wouldn't have to be a mark of where I've arrived in ministry. It could just be fun. And that's all it needs to be. I mean, not all that it needs to be. Obviously, it needs to push kids to glorify Christ, but hopefully you understand what I mean. I love that. I think if we put these things together, 
if we're asking ourselves, how do I need to die to self right now? What does it look like to embrace obscurity in my life? What fruit of the Spirit does that give greater rise to in my life? What's on the other side? I think you're right. I think that suddenly becomes a meaningful conversation rather than just a, oh, that's an, I, I think the death to self conversation can be a shaming conversation mm-hmm. in the sense of, man, well, I guess I'm just a failure. <laughs> right. Which is not what we, and this is, maybe this is an important distinction to make. Beating myself up is not dying to self. No, Those are because beating yourself up is still all about the self. Like mm-hmm. it's still self-focused. It's just in a negative light. It, it, it fails to go beyond the self to the fruit of the spirit. I mean, if we want to like keep pushing the analogy, but like it fails to just embrace what's on the other side of death to self because it's just focused on self. I think that's great. I, I... Hmm. Man. Uh, well, I want to thank you for a great conversation. And I want to, again, just like uh, Josh from Missouri said a moment ago, I want to welcome all of our new listeners. Thank you for uh, joining in. Thank you for participating on Facebook, on Instagram. If you are just new to the podcast and you haven't joined us on social media, you can look for us on On the Phone with Josh, uh, both on Facebook and Instagram. Come join the conversation. We'd love to hear from you. What is it about dying to self that you're currently doing? Where do you feel God pushing you right now? And if you were to do it, what would be the fruit of the Spirit that lays in wait for you on the other side? I would love to be inspired by all of those comments. So come join the conversation. We appreciate you, and we appreciate what you have to say. Yeah, absolutely. We can't wait to hear. Uh, Speaking of hearing, I know this is something that's been on my mind, but what have you been thinking about this week? Yeah, so it's it's interesting. I was having a conversation this week about finishing up seminary, and somebody asked if I wanted to spend some time in a pastoral role before completing my counseling degree and ultimately going on to be a counselor for pastors, missionaries, church leaders, whatever. And though I'm not close to the idea of taking on a pastoral role in some capacity at some point, the the conversation clarified for me one salient point that I feel very strongly, and not until this conversation could I actually articulate it. I don't want to run a church. I just legitimately do not want to run a church. I don't want to be in charge of programming. I don't want to be in charge of vision casting. I don't want to be in charge of budgets. I don't want to be running a bunch of meetings. I don't want to be, I know this is a horrible way to say it, but every church service is in some respects an event. You have to run an event every single week. The slides have to be right. The band Mm -hmm. has to be prepared. The volunteers have to be in place, right? You have to put on an event every single week. That takes a lot of event planning. I don't want to do any of those things. So good luck finding a pastor job because often that is what you're doing. I don't want to do that. And so chances are very high that I will not take a pastor role. I love to teach and I love to just be with people one-on-one. And that's all I want to do. So it was just clarifying for me. That's what I've been thinking about is, huh, that says it. I don't want to run a church. That's a great observation. You know, we are going to be chatting in a couple of weeks about Eugene Peterson's book, The Contemplative Pastor. And he has some specific things to say about this that I am not going to share right now. But uh, I am so excited to have that conversation because... He just has a lot to say about the role of pastor and the way it is done in 21st century America. And he is speaking directly to the way I do it and the way you just described it. And I find his thoughts very, very countercultural and 
actually his book was one of the places that had me thinking about this idea of dying to self. Um, so it'll bring the conversation all the way back around. So that's really exciting to me. Oh, I can't wait to talk about that book. Yeah. So what have you been thinking about? Uh, have I told you about the memoir of Nicholas Waltersdorf that I have been reading? Yeah, I think that provided the substance of a thought in a previous episode, actually. Okay, well, he's back. Welcome it's back, called... Mr. Waltersdorf. Yes, Dr. Waltersdorf. My apologies. It, yeah, absolutely. I'm sure he's deeply offended. Uh, so Waltersdorf uh, was a professor of philosophy at Calvin and Yale and a handful of other, of other places, both in the United States and in Europe. But he just said something that I thought was very interesting as I was listening. I, I'm just wrapping up the book. He talks about how he, over the years, began to collect mid-20th century Dutch-inspired chairs by this particular Dutch designer. And somebody asked him, as someone who has deeply thought about things like art, why is it that you collect chairs? Like, okay, it makes sense if you're going to collect art prints. It makes sense that you're going to collect pottery or vases or something, whatever. If you're, you're into art, that makes sense. But why something so almost banal as chairs? And his response, I thought, was really fascinating. He said, art has the power to dignify common acts like sitting. The act of sitting hmm. is a very simple thing. But if you sit in a beautiful chair, suddenly the act of sitting is elevated to participating in something beautiful and good. Hmm. And the idea of art being usable in this way elevates whatever it is we're doing in the context of the art. Eating off a beautiful plate elevates a meal. Sitting on a beautiful chair elevates the act of sitting. I just thought that was a really profound comment. I I couldn't agree more. I'm trying to think through other examples. And, you know, I think of like a bridge and, you know, a bridge, all you need is just a concrete slab across the river. But so many bridges are just beautiful that mm. the act of going across a bridge is enjoyable. It's it's elevated, doubly, a uh, double entendre. That's there, a but. great example of this. Uh, when we yeah. were moving to Missouri, we went out of our way to drive over the Brooklyn Bridge because I wanted to see it and because it's beautiful. Yeah, exactly. Well, let's transition here from elevated thoughts to the most commonplace. Uh, <laughs> every week we end with a Witch Josh question just to give everybody a chance to get to know us a little bit better and our story uh, a little bit more. And the question this week calls back to our time in college. And the question is, which Josh forced himself to like cheesecake because he worked for the college cafeteria. And that is me, Josh from Oregon. Uh, this is really interesting because, uh, Josh, you, Josh from Missouri, you and I both worked at the cafeteria. In fact, that's where we met. Um, yes, I was your boss. You were. You were. I've never hated a boss more. But... <laughs> <laughs> You must really like all of your bosses then. <laughs> um, so, so as you know, like while we were there, we would have to put on these. Now, it wasn't just like serving the students their like three courses every day. It was also putting on banquets for the president, hosting all the bigwigs and, you know, asking them for money. And so whether it was a, a board meeting or whether it was like these fundraising dinners or what have you, uh, we students that worked in the cafeteria would don our 
white shirts and black pants, and we would go and uh, serve and cater these meals. And inevitably, the dessert that they always had was cheesecake. It was mm-hmm. every single time. And whatever did not get served to the group, we students could eat at the end of the meal. And for a long time, I like I just didn't even like cheesecake, but I just kept seeing it and it just kept going to waste. And I'm like, well, if I want dessert, I have to like cheesecake because that's my only option. So I just ate it enough at these banquets that I ultimately found a love for cheesecake. And there you go. I forced myself to like cheesecake. Oh, man. You know, when you first said that, I was envisioning the low-grade cheesecake that was mass-produced for us in the actual cafeteria. Do you mean that? Uh, Or you're really more talking about the fancy cheesecake that was for the catering events. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's the stuff I mean. I thought about that. Yeah, yeah. We would have these wheels of, like individual slices of whatever fancy brand of cheesecake. And it would be like three slices of like mocha cheesecake and three slices of whatever. I don't know what kinds of cheesecake there are, but yes, I had forgotten about that. That was, you're right. That is what they served at every one of these fancy banquets. Yes. Yeah. And I, I mean, it looked delicious. So, I mean, eventually to me, it became delicious and it was great. Oh, man, this just made me think of a whole different Witch Josh question, but I'm going to hold that off till next week. And uh, I, I, But that's awesome. Yes, I, that, I think that may actually have been my, the birth of my like for cheesecake, too. But we're going to say it wasn't so that we, you can be the answer. <laughs> all right, but you can't you can't do it next week because now you just like forecasted to all the listeners that like you're the subject of next week's Witch Josh. So we're just going to have to mix oh, it up at some point. random date. At some point in the future, <laughs> a completely unrelated which Josh question will come up <laughs> that was inspired in no way by this conversation. Yeah, uh-huh. that worked. That worked. Yep. I'm tricky. <laughs> All right. Are we on for next week? I can't wait. All right. I'll talk to you later. All right. Bye-bye. Bye.